My name is Richard E. Avery, and I was in the U.S. Army. Robert L. Sherman, <coughs> U.S. Army. Omer DeBay, I uh, was in the infantry and ended up serving in Korea. My first week in the service was uh, very, very puzzling to me because it was brand new uh, to where you are as a young man uh, with, with no ties or anything and all of a sudden you're under their command. It, uh, it, it, is, it is an eye opener, I'll tell you that much, yes. Oh, it was very exciting, <clears throat> not knowing what is going to happen next, so. <clears throat> but it, it all worked out, so. We were all so confused that we didn't know which was going, and they tried to keep us as busy as they could to keep us out of trouble. So uh, we were meeting people all the time, and it was it went so fast that we didn't realize the first month just, just went, we went through it like it was nothing. I wound up with the 2nd Division, 37th Field Artillery Unit as finally a Jeep driver for a forward observing outfit. And it was supplying the, the uh, hill with batteries for the radios, spare radios, sea rations, and anything else they might need. I was in the 40th Infantry Division. I was a machine gunner. We were ready to fight till the end of the war, so. Well, I thought it was kind of an unnecessary thing, but we knew we had to go to protect our country, so we went voluntarily and got used to it after a while so that we could live with it. Well, something I'll always remember is uh, getting my orders to go overseas, getting on a boat with thousands of men I didn't know, and to meeting a lot of them, just walking around the deck because there was nothing much to do except waste your time during the day. Talking to a lot of them, it was just an experience I'll never forget. Yes, I have a lot of memories. <laughs> After it, it blew up the bunker, and the, the Korean Katoos ran to get a medic for me, and then they tipped me over in the bunker. I fell into the barbed wire, and they had to rip me out of the barbed wire. They tore my uniform up to carry me down the hill and then out to a uh, battalion. And then they met a, a priest that gave me the last rites. And then the next thing I know, I ended up in a mass hospital. And the last thing I remember is somebody grabbing me and I saw three doctors and that was it. So it's the women and children, I think, of the other country. Uh, I, I, I had a little girl that was uh, about, well, she was two weeks old when I left to go in the service. And uh, I always thought of what would happen if our if kids were in this situation. Uh, we've seen kids, nothing to eat, mothers with two or three little kids and nothing to eat. I, I couldn't eat when they were around. I'd end up giving my food away. <laughs> Poor little guys, you know, you see those little guys so small, so tiny, just scrambling around, trying to dig into those uh, sea rations that we had. And it, uh, it wasn't funny, it was, it was just pathetic. It was really bad. But uh, that, I think that was my whole worst time in Korea. I got wounded three times, but that wasn't half as bad as those kids. Yeah, patriotism to me is uh, standing up for your country, doing what they need, what we all need to do to keep it the way it is and protect the homeland and be proud of it. Be very proud of it. It means I'm trying to help the people in the free world so they have peace. There's no better country than the United States. And I've been to a few of them, so. There's nothing like the United States, so it means a lot to me. Oh, that's a hard word to explain. Everybody thinks of it differently. Uh, Patreon, of course, is a great thing, and uh, it's hard to explain it, really, because uh, we're so proud of our country that everything we do is a patriotic type thing, and uh, we try to make it better for our kids so they'll be better and we can see the mistakes that our parents made and things where we try to see, we think we do. And uh, I think it's a better life for it 
actually knowing and just loving our country like we do and where we got sent overseas where we could see that was different and we certainly didn't want our people over there so it's a matter of being proud of what you've got and try to save it and keep it going and make it better. Okay, please stand. Colors in place, hand salute. Two. Opening prayer, Deacon Stan Piotrowski. Please uncover. <clears throat> Almighty Father, today we gather on Memorial Day to remember those men and women who paid the supreme sacrifice for this great nation. From the American Revolutionary War up to this Memorial Day, 1,354,664 have died. May we always be reminded of their sacrifice which enables us to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let us also pray for those members of the armed forces serving around the world, that you may continue to bless and keep them out of harm's way. We also ask you, Father, to comfort the wounded during their road to recovery May we never forget their love for this country. But most of all, dear Father, we ask that you open the eyes of those who have forgotten the meaning of Memorial Day and the sacrifice of our veterans. We ask this in your name, amen. Commander Darren Pearson of the American Legion will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. The national anthem will be performed by the Bristol Brass and Wind Ensemble under the direction of Mr. Richard Theriel. Hand salute. Hello, I'd like to uh, say how happy we are to be here. This is the Bristol Brass and Wind Ensemble. Uh, they are here because they want to uh, serve not only our country, but also the city of Bristol in celebrating Memorial Day. We are also involved with this group in an ensemble concert, which is going to be shown, I think, on the big TV later on in the upcoming weeks. But we would like to start off by the playing of our national anthem. Our guest vocalist is Mr. Ken Ferris. And here we go.
Please be seated. We will now conduct the POW MIA ceremony. Uh, myself and Tim Gamash. Those who have served and those currently serving in the uniformed service of the United States are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. Before we begin our activities, we pause to recognize our POWs and our MIAs. We call your attention to this, the small table, which occupies a place of honor, is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as POWs and MIAs. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and their families. So we join together to pay tribute to them and to be witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his or her suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose in a vase signifies the blood they may have shed and sacrificed to ensure the freedom of our beloved United States of America. This rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrade who kept faith while awaiting their return. The red ribbon on the vase represents the red ribbon worn on the lapel of the thousands who demand with unyielding determination a proper accounting of our comrades who are not amongst us. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless fallen tears of the families as they wait. The glass is inverted they cannot toast with us at this time. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope, which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors, to the open arms of a grateful nation. The American flag reminds us that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Let us pray to the Supreme Commander that all of our comrades will soon be back within our ranks. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and participating in our Memorial Day observance. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the Bristol Brass and Wind Ensemble has, has stepped, last year they uh, had an octet, I believe it was, and this year they're going with their full ensemble. Um, and they will be taking the military medley uh, and playing that and then inserting that into this program uh, as we go forward. So uh, everything, was, everything came together and, uh, and uh, I think everybody will be happy. Thank you. 
Next, I'd like to have greetings from the city of Bristol, uh, <coughs> excuse me, presented by Mayor Ellen Zaposasso. Good morning. On behalf of the city, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate in the Memorial Day event. Unfortunately, this is the second Memorial Day that we are unable to gather as a community on Memorial Boulevard. We are celebrating the Boulevard's 100th anniversary this year, and I hope that everyone has the opportunity to visit it over Memorial Day and see the wonderful banners that have been erected by the Veterans Council and the Parks Department honoring our Korean War veterans. This year, we again make comparisons to the pandemic that we are going through and the small comparison of what we think our soldiers must have gone through. Today, we are dealing with isolation from family members, illness. We are tracking the dead in our community from this vicious disease. And I can only imagine that this is just a small window of what it must have been like for our war heroes and what they've endured as part of their efforts on behalf of our country. So today, I stand with you on behalf of the City Council so that we can continue to honor their memories and ensure that no one forgets their stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Our guest speaker for Memorial Day 2021 will be United States Air Force Colonel retired Robert M. Gabor. Colonel Gabor, born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, currently resides in Bristol, Connecticut with his wife, Connie. They are the proud parents of a son, Aaron, and a daughter, Allison. Colonel Gabor received a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Connecticut and was commissioned as a distinguished graduate. He also received a master's degree from Golden Gate University. Colonel Gabor has accumulated 2,600 flying hours in the F-4D FG aircraft, including combat missions in Southeast Asia. Colonel Gabor has also served as an FY, and he's going to explain these letters that I have no idea what they are. He's going to explain those when he gets up. It's code. It's code or oh, it's code. It's code. It's code. Well, now I know what it is. <laughs> I, you know? A weapons school instructor at Nellis Air Force Base and operations officer at George Air Force Base. Colonel Gabor has been awarded numerous commendations, many of which include Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Meritorious Service Medal with four Oak Leaf Clusters, Combat Readiness Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster, Air Force Longevity Service Award Ribbon with five Oak Leaf Clusters. A lot of clusters. That's what happens when you manage to live. <laughs> Colonel Gabor retired from active duty on October 1, 2001, after completing 30 years on active duty and 14 years as the commander, command teaching uh, Air Force Junior ROTC units at Yukon and Torrington High School, a total of 44 years in uniform. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Colonel Robert M. Gabor. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be here today, and, and I appreciate being asked to uh, speak at today's event. Here in Bristol, we're commemorating Memorial Day on 2021 by especially honoring the Korean War veterans. But before I discuss those two topics, <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge you the audience. There are plenty of other things that you could be doing on a special day like today. Many distractions could pull you away from this special event. You might be like some of your friends, family, or neighbors. They could be at the shore or at a barbecue or possibly at a ball game all fun ways to spend a holiday, but you chose to be at this special event because it means something to you. And because of this day, 
These men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice and these Korean War veterans hold a special place in your heart. It's not that the other Americans are, who chose to celebrate this day in another fashion aren't any less patriotic. Sometimes they just need to be reminded of the true reason for Memorial Day. Fewer and fewer Americans are cognizant of what their military does for them. Since the draft ended, less than 1% of the American population goes into service in the military. And after honoring these real heroes, there'll be still plenty of time for the other distractions in modern America. Memorial Day is meant to honor service members who paid the ultimate sacrifice. They paid for our freedoms with their lives. They are America's blood and treasure, and their sacrifice in every war from the Revolutionary War that freed us from the bonds of England to our current engagements all around the world to make our enemies in this world, and there are many, shed their blood on foreign lands so that our country can be preserved long into the future. If we could raise these heroes up and ask them why they paid with their lives, almost to a man or a woman, they would say that it wasn't some flowery platitude about keeping America safe for generations to come. No, they would say it was to protect that soldier, sailor, airman, or marine standing to their left or right. But the bottom line is, their blood was shed so that the nation could grow into and maintain the position in this world as the greatest nation on earth. Some examples of America's true airmen heroes from the Korean War are Major George Davis, posthumously promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. He was a P-47, nicknamed the Jug, fighter pilot. So I'll try to go through some of these explanations at that time. Okay. <laughs> I could spell it out for you if you like, Art. Um, he was a flying ace during World War II, which meant that he shot down uh, at least five enemy aircraft. Uh, that's when he was flying with the U.S. Army Air Force during World War II. And he was awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the highest medal to be awarded to uh, military service members. And it was for his actions during the Korean War that he was honored. He received the Medal of Honor because of his action in MiG Alley when he attacked 12 MiG 15s with his single F 86 fighter. Now, MiG 15 was the first uh, jet aircraft that the Soviet Union had, fighter aircraft that the Soviet Union had. Now, these 12 uh, MiGs were about to attack uh, Air Force fighter bombers who were uh, rolling in on targets on the ground. So with his single jet, he shot down two of these MiGs, and he was lining up a third to be shot down when he was shot down and killed in action. But because of his bravery, the friendlies were able to attack their target, successfully destroy that target, and return to base safely. Or other airmen. Sorry, after a 30-year uh, career flying uh, Air Force fighters and teaching for 14 years up at Torrington uh, with the junior ROTC, I'm most familiar with Air Force heroes. So from my fellow comrades, please excuse me if I focused on them. 
uh, this, uh, this Major Louis Sibyl and Major Charles Loring both sacrificed their lives uh, in very similar fashions, and they both earned the Medal of Honor. Major Seville was on a mission flying F-51s, attacking a camouflaged anti-aircraft gun emplacement. Now, an F-51, most of you probably recognize as the P-51 Mustang during World War II. During World War II, we were still with the Army, and P stood for pursuit. When we became our own service in 1947, they changed the de designation to F for fighter. So he's attacking anti-aircraft gun emplacements. During his attack, his aircraft was severely damaged. But rather than abandon the aircraft and survive, he pressed the attack on enemy forces that were threatening the security of friendly forces. And to inflict the maximum amount of damage on the enemy, he dove his aircraft into the enemy target. Major Charles Loring was dive bombing uh, enemy gun positions near Sniper Ridge in North Korea in his F-80 fighter bomber when his aircraft was repeatedly struck by ground fire. But instead of safely withdrawing, he deliberately maneuvered his aircraft, altering his original dive bombing attack and purposefully dove his aircraft into the gun emplacement, completely destroying it. His selfless heroic act eliminated a dangerous threat to United Nations ground forces. And as a side note, Loring Air Force Base in Maine is named after Major Loring. These are but a few of all of the service's heroes during the Korean War, and we rightfully honor them on Memorial Day and this year, 2021. As I said, here in Bristol, we're spending uh, this year honoring our Korean War uh, veterans. And even though most of these veterans, during any time frame that they served, never would consider themselves heroes, they would usually refer to the service members such as Lieutenant Colonel Davis and Major Sibyl and Loring as the true heroes. But everyone who served honorably their country as a military member is a hero. Whether they served on the front lines or never left their post, their base, their uh, port here in the United States, they are still heroes. Since individuals needed to fulfill every role required by their individual military service and by our grateful nation, that duty had to be performed by someone and they fulfilled that role honorably. So therefore they are heroes. Especially though our Korean War veterans should be hailed as heroes. Because for years, as most people in this audience will remember, our politicians referred to the Korean War as a police action. And therefore the nation referred to it as a police action. But ask any soldier, sailor, airman, or marine who was in country, whether they were on the ground at Pusan, Chosin Reservoir, or Pork Chop Hill, or flying in Mig Alley, or bombarding the coast with ships off, off uh, the Korean uh, Peninsula, they'll tell you that it was a significant war, as hot and as deadly as any other war that the United States has ever uh, been, excuse me, ever uh, been engaged in. And their sacrifice allowed us to be in the position that we are today. So these men and women who served bravely and honorably because they knew that their role was bigger than themselves 
and they wound up sacrificing themselves. It was true back in the Revolutionary War, and it will be true in any future conflict that the United States gets into or during peacetime. I would like to personally thank everyone here or viewing from home for taking the time to honor these heroes that provide for our cherished freedoms today. Thank you. The Colonel just told me that immediately following these ceremonies, there'll be a test and all those code letters that we said before. Okay. Colonel, thank you for your service and your dedication and your presentation. We will now pay homage to those Bristol veterans who gave the supreme sacrifice for God and country. World War I veterans' names will be read by Korean War era veteran Robert Barnett. The following are the 52 members from Bristol who died during World War II. Anthony Belneriak, William Bolton, John Bresnahan, Reginald Brown, Sebastian Kresnia, Carl Carlson, Bertrand Carroll, James Coventry, Jr., Theron uh, Davis, Herman DeCole, James Dooley, George A. Downs, Vernon R. Downs, Timothy Driscoll, Walter Durgeon, um, Archie Eastland, Roy Edmond, Leon G. Fink, Wilbur Fish, Ernest Firth, John Flanagan, Dewey Green, John Gutzka, Eric Hedquist, uh, J. Harold Hinckley, Montag Horsley, Richard W. Ibell, Theodore Isley, Max Killian, Augusta Kowalski, Damaski J. Laflame, William Legassi, Morris Lappy, Elmer Linden, Raymond W. Merrill, A. Dewey Munn, William Newman, Victor Nicastro, William D. Nolan, Fritz Ob Oberg, William Potts, Joseph Pratt, John Predona, Augusta Reed, Eugene R R Rodolfi, Floyd W. Ritter, Leon R. Roberts, William J. Schaefer, John J. Kelsey, Arthur V. Stevenson, Albert L. Taylor, and John L. Zelko. World War II veterans' names will be read by Vietnam War veteran Richard Pernet and Korean War veteran Association member Sheila Basquet. Good morning. This is the roster of the World War II deceased who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Edwin J. Ardensky. Harold N. Orby, William J. Bachman, Ernest L. Bacon, Henry G. Bartley, James J. Beattie, Victor J. Bichard, Arthur L. Berent, John B. Benoit, Jr., Richard Bingham, Theodore Blakesley, Wilbur H. Blakesley, Irvine N. Blanchard, Robert W. Brandt, Leonard H. Broadwell, John N. Budway, Steve W. Bugnarski, Leonard J. Butler, William D. Caminiti, 
Raymond J. Carroll, Albie G. Charette, Raymond J. Claudia, James T. Collins, Robert E. Koloski, Royden E. Conopask, Claire M. Konzalman, Wesley J. Cookson, Dale A. Colbath, Vito P. Copy, Irving W. Corrigan, Alex P. Szynski, Louis A. Dainty, William H. Davis, Raymond L. Decker, Roby J. DeMars, Vito W. DeSato, Edward J. Dzinski, Francis C. Duncan, James T. Dunnell, Walter A. Dunnells, Alexandra W. Dzinski, Richard F. Anson, John J. Foster, Edward J. Fornia, Edward L. Froelich, Joseph L. Gatiss, Richard F. Gervais, Joseph E. Gillis, Rex Green, Jr., Joseph C. Gurn, Artema Gursky, W. Robert Hackbath, Russell J. Hall, Ralph B. Harden, Thomas F. Harrigan, Alfred G. Hart, Robert J. Hava, Edward D. Hiddleman, Floyd E. Holmes, Crowey L. Holstein, Philip J. Hoskins, Alan R. Huntley, Dudley S. Ingram, Jr., Alan T. Johnson, James H. Johnson, Benjamin G. P. Joy, Nicholas Catsasaro, Thomas J. Kelly, Vincent P. Kelly, Walter Kilman, John I. Krolik, Anthony F. Krizak, Walter A. Kuchowski, Joseph R. Cups, Ignacy J. Lazowski, Elma R. Levesque, Armin J. LaRue, John A. Linick, Louis E. Lomas, John J. Lynch. Joseph Manzone, Adelard A. Marcel, Joseph Marseglia, Whitfield Martin, Darius Masako, Victor J. Mastriani, Donald J. McMahon, William J. McCoskey, James L. Mitchell, Vincenzo J. Marone, Alexander Nielsen, Dominic T. Nicotera, Jr., Vito Pigliarulo, Joseph D. Perante, Robert F. Penda, Louis A. Peters, Anthony P. Petrowski, Joseph N. Petrowski, Roland A. Phoenix, Thomas C. Poland, Jr., Patrick G. Pozella, John V. Quinto, William J. Radaskowitz, Reginald B. Lejeune, Rajun, Dennis A. Rich, Jr., Harold Reinflush, James F. Reardon, Chester J. Sedleski, Donald L. Short, Harrison M. Smith, Jr., James E. Sorensen, Jr., William J. Spielman, Thomas C. Stanley, Stanley F. Staskowitz, Frank Stenger, Jr., Edward Skrakowski, Harold R. Teller, Philip Testa, Rocco A. Testa, William M. Thier, Robert E. Therian, Raymond D. Thompson, Willard J. Toussaint, Robert F. Turner, Paul H. Vaness, Peter Ventrella, Raymond H. Vebe, Norman E. Wasley, Bromley L. Webb, Joseph P. Weeks, Carol W. Wheeler, Ernest A. Wilson, William F. Winters, Wing L. Wong, Frederick J. Woodard, Edmund P. Zabikowski, Francis B. Zabrowski, Edward G. Zaransky, and Bronislaw Zukowski.
Korean War veterans' names will be read by James Busquet, Korean War Veteran Association President. These are the names of the veterans that made the ultimate sacrifice in the Korean War. James E. Bear, George J. Barnett, Jr., Louis M. Caputo, Christy A. Chekis, John E. Collette, Harold E. Couch, Donald P. Dumond, Wayne Goodenough, Raymond E. Lemire, Frederick W. Lockshear, Joseph W. Lysite, John A. Norris, Robert J. Roberge, David N. White. Vietnam War veterans' names will be read by Vietnam veteran Dave Haplow. Lawrence Joseph Pelletier. Melvin A. Wade, Roland Philip Levesque, Gilbert Thibault, Robert Michael Jacob, Philip Frank Nestico, Aldo Eugene Ryder, David Bruce Emmon, Matthew Martin Canfield, Jr., David Dennis Olette, Peter Philip Dubell, Joseph J. Paparello, Alfred James Guidas, Edward J. Christensen, Thomas J. Blanchard, Douglas J. Beveridge, Eugene R. Johnson. May they forever rest in peace. Now I'd like to hear uh, Commander Darren Pearson, American Legion. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Your Honor the Mayor, Deacon, Major, uh, Colonel. Tim Gamash, thank you. People at home and uh, our guests here today, thank you very much for spending a few minutes here. Um, Having events and ceremonies like this is one of the ways that the American Legion fulfills the uh, four pillars that we talk about all the time. Um, veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation, uh, Americanism, National Security, Children and Youth. This falls under that. Doing events like this will, will help us fulfill our mission. Um, the, I see several members of the Post 2 Honor Guard here, and you guys definitely help fulfill our mission. When you go to a military funeral and you see our honor guard, uh, art's part of the honor guard too, when they do their rifle salute and taps and present the brass and the flag to the family, it, it really it means something to the family. It chokes me up every time just talking about it when we, when we send off another one of our members to post everlasting, but you guys do a great job. So as always, another great presentation. I know it's gonna, Nutmeg's gonna do a, fine job as they did last year and uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this and thank you everybody for coming. Commander. Please stand. Our closing prayer will now be led by Deacon Stanley Piotrowski. Dear Father in heaven, 
as we bring this Memorial Day ceremony to a close, may we never forget those who paid the supreme sacrifice. If not for these brave men and women who gave their lives for our freedom, would we be able to stand here and say thank you to them? Not too long ago, I read a statement made by Army Sergeant First Class Jack Robinson while he was serving in Iraq. He stated, Sometimes I think God must be creating an elite unit in heaven because he only seems to select the very best soldiers to bring home early. Can you imagine, even in the midst of war itself, he is able to make a profound statement like that? For those who God has called home, may they rest in peace. Let us pray that God will continue to watch over our veterans and keep them safe. And may God bless America. Amen. Before closing, uh, following this ceremony, we will proceed to Memorial Boulevard, where we'll lay the wreaths at the appropriate monuments, uh, followed by the rifle volley and taps as performed by the American Legion and Honor Guard. We would now like to play a special tribute to all of the armed forces in our country called the Armed Forces Salute. We have uh, the service songs from all the various branches of the armed forces being played in this medley. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful stirring medley that we just love to play. So without further ado, we'd like to play Armed Forces Salute.
Colors being in place, hand salute, two. Thank you very much.